It's my pleasure to introduce Bob Schill, um, architect, head of the architecture school at Bartlett. Um, and, and I know his lecture is going to be about both his practice and the work in the school. And usually in the introductions, I tend to focus in the work of the individual. But in this case, uh, the office work, in this case, I don't think we can separate. Um, like, I think it's one of the things that we have in common. Um, I was thinking if um, the relation of Sayak and Bartlett has been going on for many, many years, and it has very different faces. Um, there are many other schools that we have a really good relation, but probably it's hard to find one that we have probably more in common than the Bartlett. I mean, the Bartlett, uh, at least in the last 30 years of their life, has been um, um, a refugee for imagination, a refugee for speculation, a refugee for we all aspire architecture to be. But also have to say, in the last five or six years, um, um, with Bob Shield and, and also Frederick Migaru, the school has um, pumped up the volume in a trajectory that I find um, completely exciting and exuberant and sophisticated and playful. And this is something that I always admire of the British uh, logic, even though Bob is Irish, so Irish are different than British. But the Bartlett being a British institution, they always have a, a good sense of humor and eccentricity. And I think eccentricity, I always think, is a, is a phenomenal quality that I think in America we are not so capable of doing. And this is something I always admire from far about the, the work of the Bartlett. But also Bob in his own practice, um, like, like a guy, again, I think a, a lot in common with Sayak about between the relation between practice and academia, is he has always been invested in kind of an alternative way to think about architecture, through making, design, writing. And ultimately, I, I, I would say without any sense of shyness, it, to me, is the kind of architecture that we all should be interested in. It's the architecture that provokes, it's the architecture that makes us things, it's architecture that challenge. And I think at the end of the day, in the school or in practice, Architecture is a form of knowledge and is a form of cultural practice. And I think any form of knowledge can take uh, many parts, and one has to do with the rational thinking, but the other one has to do with the notion of imagination and how cognitive knowledge get accumulated to that. And I tend to think that despite our best effort uh, in, in architecture of trying to, trying to box it in kind of a series of rational rules, it's at the end of the day the logic of cognitive imagination what push forward. And I think Bob Shield represents uh, that spirit and that logic of architecture. So I'm really, really excited and happy to have him here. Uh, and hopefully this is not only a continuation of the long-term tradition of Sayag and, and Bartlett, but it's kind of a reboot that will take us to new horizons and then we can collaborate and keep working together. So please join me to welcome Bob Shield to Sayag. Thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here, and, um, and thank you very, very much for that introduction, which does set me up perfectly for giving a sketch at the beginning about what I want to talk about. I, I, I did think, of course, for a while, what I, would, what I would talk about if you get an invitation as distinguished as this, and it's very, very true. It's impossible right now for me to separate my own work from what's going on in my life right now, which is mainly um, having this extraordinary privilege to run the School of Architecture as its director. Frederic is the chair, of course, is the role that Peter Cook occupied for, for 15 years. And there are two things, I think, that really maybe um, stand out for me, that inform me on a daily basis in this role. One is I was a student in the school the year before Peter arrived. So I, I was in first year. I saw a pretty flat first year. And then I saw this extraordinary transformation occur in my second year. And I think that experience is something that actually only very few of us uh, in the school have. Um, lots of staff in the school, obviously all the students, were not there at that time. To see that the power of how a school can, can flip on its head in one year is, is really quite extraordinary. The other thing that I guess informs me in a very obvious way is that when I was invited to teach at the Bartlett, 
I was invited to teach in the workshop with my mate Nick Calicott. And that was because we were making lots of stuff and they thought, well, that would be kind of an interesting place to, to plug them, them in. And we started running a unit from the workshop. And I had no idea, of course, <laughs> in those days that I'd end up um, in this position today to talk about the sorts of things we're here to talk about tonight. So it's more or less going to be a talk is split down the middle, but in three parts. So the first two parts would be talking about the influences of my students. Uh, the second part will be talking about the work I've developed in practice as a researcher and as an ed educator and as, as, a, as a maker. Uh, and, and then the third part about is what is going on with us today? What's going on in the School of Architecture today? And this connection we have particularly with SciArc. So the title really is informed by one of the reasons I'm here, is that we've reignited the exchange between the two schools, which I think is really, really wonderful. Um, that relationship goes back an awfully long time, the relationship between London and LA. I was in the Getty Center yesterday, just walking through this space, and up pops Rainer Banham on a screen, almost perfectly timed as I walked. It was really spooky. It was quite an extraordinary thing. So the talk is this notion of transformation to exchange. And I really want to emphasize this notion of exchange and explore it in, in all its possible ways, uh, in, in factual and fictional sorts of ways. I'm also going to take the talk through in loops. So it's, there are going to be sort of three chronological loops, talking about student work and how it's evolved uh, in, in the time that I've worked with those students, then my own work, how it evolved, and then how the school evolved. So these are three, three loops I want to go through in succession. I also want to just put across the notion, um, of course, that one of the attractions to our discipline and our subjects is that uh, ideas are in perpetual metamorphosis. Um, they're both intellectual and they're practical. And this word exchange to me is extremely powerful. It's something we gave, we gave a name to our workshops. One of the tasks I was invited to do was to reorganize all our resources in the school about 10, 15 years, 10, 12 years ago. And we gave the workshops the name the Bartlett Manufacturing and Design Exchange. This notion of transaction seemed to me to be incredibly powerful and, and, and present in these spaces. Workshops in schools of architecture are not like workshops anywhere else. They mimic workshops in other places, but they have unique qualities of their own. But they are about transaction. And the word exchange, of course, is associated in history with notions of corn exchange, wool exchange, stock exchange. These places where goods are brought to a place and their meaning and value are transformed. I think that's what happens in, in our workshops. So the first section of the talk, as I mentioned, is going to be about the influences of uh, the, the students I've had the pleasure to work with. We've always done this thing with our students is take a photograph of them in a staged kind of place, a place of production or a, pla a place of, of action. And I'm going to talk about the people who I love working with. So we obviously have a good time from time to time. And these are the people who I've um, been working with for the longest period of time. In the middle, Phil Ayres, to his left, Nick Calicott, and then to the far right, Chris Leong, and in the back, Emmanuel Vercusa and Kate Davies, who are hugely important to the work. I've, I've pretty much done nothing on my own in my entire life. I've always relied on other people to operate. And then I'm going to talk about transformations of, of a school. And uh, one of the reasons for it, you know, I, I, I'm not here to sort of promote the Bartlett at all. I think it's an honor to be here. But I do think what we've been through is similar to things you've been through, and they're once in a generation transformations. We've been through nine building moves in four years, uh, involving over uh, 1,200 students and, and, and 300 staff. That took quite a lot of energy. Uh, it soaked up, you know, a lot of time. But it did reveal fascinating things. That's myself and Frederic de, down there at the bottom. Frederic is the director of architecture at the Pompidou Center. He comes in twice a month and runs BPRO and has a very influential role in the school as a provocateur from the outside. A very, very different type of chair to Peter Cook. And I'm keeping the place going on a sort of a week to week basis. So just to kind of immediately jump in for the very obvious, you may have seen this, this um, animation. It's by ScanLab, who I know have spoken here um, some years ago. But this is a, an overlay of, of the 3D scan of the new building overlaid on the shell of the old building. Architecturally, Waits House, 22 Gordon Street, whatever its name is, doesn't matter. What really matters is really how the organization of this building and the spaces within it are being used now in two entirely different ways. 
It, the original building was built in 1975 and was pretty dysfunctional on the day it opened. It was designed for 350 students and about 15 staff. Uh, we reached a point where we had 1,000 students needing this building and 300 staff, a lot of part-timers, clearly didn't work. So you can see in the way in which this image has been put together, the schools expanded an awful lot. We only had about 50% of the original building in the first instance. Now we have 100% of a building that's nearly twice the size. So the architecture school has grown enormously. And I think things that matter here in this context is just to think of it as a place of production. Uh, I think roughly speaking about 3,000 projects a year come out of this building. Um, all of them generally better than this building. You know, the building serves its needs. It's a very straightforward building, which is what the brief was. But there are 3,000 ideas coming out of this which are challenging notions of practice. They're challenging notions of what defines a project, a building, a, a, a method, a process, and so forth. And I think that in intensity comes across um, now in a much more porous way in, in how this space is organized. The original building, of course, its dysfunctionality was something that Peter and Christine put to, to uh, um, very direct use to set up the unit system in a cellular separate uh, set of uh, constellations that started to, in a sense, run secretive practices. Uh, and only the, the kind of fruits of that work could be exhibited at the end of the year at, the, at a show, such as the one you're looking at now. Now what happens in the school is very much as what's happening here, is you see work in production throughout the year. And I think the fear of thinking that might uh, create a sense of homogeneity in the school has been dispelled. Diversity seems to almost um, excel in, cer in, certain, in, in such spaces. So we've been through that transformation, and it's taken... Um, an awful lot of, um, it was raised an awful lot of questions, which I'll, I'm going to come back to in remaining parts of the talk. Yeah, I'm just going to reach up some water. So let's get into influences, kind of thoughts, ideas that cut across decisions, projects, uh, and practices. This building's the same age as me, more or less, and I think one thing that, that always strikes me looking at it today is just what's happened in my lifetime in relation to practice. But also the inherent knowledge, and ta particularly tacit knowledge and skill in the production of this building and buildings of its type uh, portrayed. It was at a cusp of a certain period where form and geometries and processes were at a certain peak. There was a relationship to the design and how things were made that was, that was kind of intimate. Uh, and, and, and yet some of these geometries are being rediscussed today in very, very different terms without discussing the same sorts of conversations that took place there. Uh, much later on, 2002, uh, I was talking to Liam earlier on this afternoon in the library about influences. And for me, one thing that we cannot escape from is this, our own trajectory. Our current first year students in the school this year were born in the year 2000 and they'll kind of hit the coal face of their careers in 2035, 2036. Uh, you know, I was born in the mid-60s. Imagining what their practice might be like, what their lives might be like in 2035 is the, is the challenge of the school. It's, um, that's exactly why we get up every day. This period of time we've lived through, though, has had an se extraordinary set of um, challenges put upon it, particularly around the notion of what do architects do and how do they do it. This project for me in 2002, the Toy Toyo Ito and Cecil Baumann Pavilion in, the, in, in Hyde Park, was an intriguing reflection of one of the dilemmas that have always faced us as architects. We've often been ahead of the capability of construction to meet our ideas uh, uh, face to face. So whilst this building was touted in, in, in those days as being one of the first digitally fabricated uh, buildings, you know, derived through an, an algorithm. It was made in, by hand. It was made entirely by ancient processes that were hundreds of years old. So those sorts of contradictions are also um, of immense interest to me, and, the, and, and in, in a way that's uncomfortable, uh, in, in a useful way. Another world that I think we, 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 we embrace in, in our um, operations, and I think which is certainly the case in in, in this school and in the Bartlett, is the notion of experiment between the drawing, the making, the performance, the event, the idea, and the collaboration. So I'm fascinated by organizations like La Machine in, in Nantes, in, in, in Brittany, 
Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with their work. Uh, the way in which the work moves from residing in the drawing or in the performance or in the artifact or in the technologies that made it or those that are hidden from how it's made. I'm fascinated by contradictions that we live with. When I was a student, I did my thesis on a new thing called ground probing radar that had just come out. And I went to speak to one of the senior researchers uh, at Arabs in London about ground probing radar. And, uh, but they were telling me that at the same time they were using diviners uh, to back up this new technology. They weren't sure if this new technology was, was really accurate enough, so they were backing it up with diviners, uh, which I think is something which has um, uh, always been part of, of the, um, the conversations through our, our work. And then there's this notion of just materiality, tactility, and, 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 and this is a very challenging question now today, as we're shifting through to technologies of representation that seem to allude to a, an incredible richness and depth to materiality, and yet they're not material at all. So we kind of live with fake kind of representations, and we're kind of in this really weird, weird position of talking about things that are physical, but representing them in, in, in technologies that aren't. So to pay tribute for a few moments to, to, to my students, um, and this is going much faster than I thought it would. <laughs> um, my students have always responded to these sorts of things in incredibly inventive ways. Um, um, one student, for example, um, Berger, who flipped up there a moment ago, looked, was intrigued by how human race is kind of losing its peripheral vision. And what would a world be like if we became only foveal focused? Um, other projects, Thomas Pierce here, I can't, I'm just trying to pause that, can I pause that now? Um, Thomas Pierce, uh, one of my students a few years back who I'm working with now, doing a lot of uh, work through making and through, say, digital uh, metrology processes, was starting to raise questions of the notion of the architectural ghost. That we, that we might live in a world where the physical is, is merely a host or, a, or to a digital sonography that we occupy and, and, and kind of swim through. These sorts of ideas are represented and explored by other figures such as um, uh, Tom Slivens, who, who based his project on the Bradbury building, notions of fiction, moving through projects and those stories emerging, emerging through the physical. Um, one of the things I didn't expect to do when, when, when I started out in architecture was to write, um, and, but it's something I've ended up doing, and it's turned out to be an intrinsically important part of the practice. Uh, but I've only written fairly periodical kind of phases, so these three books came out in 2004, 2008, and 2012. And these, the, is this rhythm of a certain set of questions emerging and needing to come together in publications like AD started to fuel and accelerate conversations in the studio. So design through making in 2004 was really driven by just the idea of that early digital fabrication period, work of people like Philip Beasley, who were starting to look at processes of making things that using technologies from the fashion industry, from fabric technologies and so on, to try and shift into that world of the, um, the, 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 the the, the, the lightness that one sees in those sorts of materials and getting away from the heaviness that we might often assume with making and, and, and construction. Uh, Proto-architecture uh, came a bit later and that was trying to um, postulate on the idea that what drives certainly a lot of my interests and a, a, lot, of, a lot of those I like to collaborate with is, is the way in which we embrace that every building is a prototype. And that every, there is, in fact, a practice of making buildings that are prototypes that one could call proto-architecture. Buildings that allude to many more things than what they are in themselves, literally. And then manufacturing the bespoke that came a bit later on was trying to articulate this in, in slightly greater depth and challenging something which seemed to be moving in, a, in this direction of specificity and uniqueness, mass customization, these questions that need to be, needed to be asked. I followed that up in the last book that I, 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 uh, that I published before I took over as head of school with high definition, Negotiating Zero Tolerance. And one of the main debates in that book that I was interested in exploring was as we progress to a world with ever more accurate and precise technologies, particularly around metrology and measurement, 
which could be driven by a way of measuring fault and error uh, and, and somehow dampening down notions of, of creativity and experimentation. Uh, we need to retrieve the conversation about measuring the value of tolerance. Tolerance, you know, the way I was educated originally, you kind of design to plus or minus 10 millimeters, maybe even 25 millimeters, depending on the technology. But there, there is a, a tendency to go with technology uncritically uh, and accept zero tolerance as this, this kind of um, straitjacket that sits, sits upon us. And, and, and that was one of the conversations that comes out in that, in that set of essays, which is to re-examine re the notion of the value of, of tolerance. How, how else can we put it in other than just arguing it for the margins of error that exist in our industries? Something else which has come out of this period of time is the Fabricate conference series, which we started in 2011 and then it went to Stuttgart in 2017 after it was in Zurich in, in 2014. And what's the main motivation behind Fabricate is to get people to write who don't normally write about things that are really interesting and of incredible value and, and um, weight at a very particular point in time. So writing about projects before they're complete is really one of the sort of genesis concepts behind Fabricate. And within that, there is now a growing community of, of practitioners and researchers uh, and collaborators starting to understand this kind of world of proto-architecture, world of, pro of, 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 of experimentation and research in those early stages of projects, that some of which converts into buildings and some of it doesn't. Just to complete that first set of loops, um, all of that kind of teaching trajectory uh, uh, that I've been through has just popped up in one of our new programs in Here East, which I'm going to show you a bit later on in the talk. But uh, one of the new programs is called Design for Manufacture. And as I was saying to Liam earlier on this afternoon, one of the key motivations behind this project actually, actually is to attract people other than architects into architecture schools. One of the things that we've found in the Bartlett over the last two decades or so is that we become quite rehearsed, should I say, you know, at our, in our comfort zone. Yeah? We become quite rehearsed in the, in the areas of practice that we seem to excel in. But there's a desperate need to, to uh, subvert that from time to time. There's a need to, to turn that on its head from time to time, like I witnessed back in the early 90s. So Design for Manufacture is one of those programs, and it's attracting students from all sorts of different backgrounds. I'm just going to play this short two-minute video and let them talk about it. This program is very much interested in training designers to understand fabrication processes or understand how things are made and then use that understanding to make better design decisions. So the title of the project is Sloppy Topologies, Precise Datums and this work explores experiments in inflating sheets of steel. It's interested in how this unpredictable forming process could be explored or used where the outcome is quite uncertain. I'm not sure exactly what form will be made, so I haven't made any attempt to predict that. But then using high resolution 3D scanning, we can capture all that information, and then I've made precise parts to fit with that. And that's about this combination of a low tolerance handmade process and a precise machined part coming together. My project's title is PTP, a robotic fabrication from point to point. We basically wanted to use a robot to perform a set of carpentry tasks in a seamless digital workflow. We had to create our own custom hardware in order to create uh, unique uh, three-dimensional prismatic uh, joints that have the ability to self-line, self-lock and uh, transfer forces from one element to another. There's always this feedback from the physical to the digital and vice versa. I think what I've most enjoyed is having hands-on access to relevant industry equipment, you know, high-tech facilities, being able to go into the workshop, design things, test things extremely quickly, having these feedback loops between designing and making with tools that yeah, you, I wouldn't otherwise normally have access to. I think the most unique part of this program was uh, that we had the opportunity to meet the different uh, tutors, technicians that have influenced my work and showed me how I can really make what I have in my mind. 
I had the opportunity to work in this uh, workshop, the new workshop at Here East. There are so many disciplines under the same roof, like computer scientists, engineers, architects, artists, that uh, we're all there in order to create and innovate and inspire one another. Taking in the constraints and parameters of the tools that exist in industry and understanding how they can be used instead of just designing something, sending it off to someone else to make, understanding how things are made, understanding how materials behave, understanding how tools work, and the combination of those things leads to innovation. So um, Matthew, the guy in that video, um, came from an art background. He, he comes from a background where he was making art for quite famous artists in London. And that's a, kind of a, a, a sector of our, the world of production, of the, the production of designs, the artifacts that are aesthetically driven, considered in their materiality and in their processes. That is incredibly specific and demanding. And it, it, one of the you know, richness, uh, the, the rich qualities of that conversation coming into the architecture school is that different perspective on the same technologies that architecture students are taking on. Marilena's piece is neither structural nor about timber. It's actually about workflow. It's about taking command of the kind of um, the journey of, of, the, of, of the information from its, its conception through to delivery and looking upon the artifact as a reflection of the performance of the idea. So to start the next loop, I'm going to go back to the beginning of my own kind of career for a while, and it's a very different one. So you've seen a kind of a fast track kind of view of say the last 15, 20 years in teaching. But um, I, I've, I come from a very different background where we used to draw in, in, in this sort of a way. You used to you know, draw by hand, you used to paint your drawings, you used to sandpaper your drawings, you used to ride bicycles over your drawings, you used to do all these sorts of things. And there was this, um, and again, of course, this is in that period that I described earlier when Peter and Christine took over the school. There was a great sense of, um, complete and utter freedom, no, no boundaries at all to what could possibly describe or limit a drawing. So we did you know, quite a lot with pencils and ink in those days. But actually, in, strangely enough, earlier on, myself and Nick decided the thing that we wanted to do, which was facilitated by, by, by that kind of period of, of reinvention, was to reinvent our own form of practice. We didn't articulate it in quite those terms at the time, but we moved out of the school because it had rubbish workshops. They didn't, their, their workshop technician was pretty grumpy and unhelpful. And we moved into this small little unit in East London and started um, making furniture, taking ourselves extremely seriously in the back of Land Rovers, and starting to make these sort of subversive artifacts in our mind that were not only kind of challenging our sense of place in the world as makers and designers and architects, but also the kind of conversations we might have in the school so, um, and this was something that, you know, Peter and, uh, and Christine embraced, but not everybody did. This piece was based in an allotment in South London. I think you call them common gardens over here, or these sorts of spaces you can rent to grow vegetables. Uh, we rented this double-sized um, uh, lot in, 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 this is in the mid-1990s. And, and over a period of time, cultivated architecture on this site and, and brought these pieces into the school, you know, as kind of finished pieces. So. On reflection, you know, what, what I can understand now is we were, report, we were reporting on the, the, um, the performance of an event rather than the, the preview of a design. And it's the reversal of what one normally expects, or we certainly expected in, in, in the school in those days. Uh, to make our living, we also made furniture for clients just to get by. And we were sharing workshop spaces with characters like Harry here, who's long since gone, I fear. I haven't seen him for a long time, but he was pretty elderly back in the early, early 1990s. And we made these sorts of pieces, which, is, which to me, to my surprise, not having had any background in making, seemed to come together quite easily through a background in drawing. Uh, it's a bit more obvious in these pieces. Uh, these were collaborations uh, with friends, other architects, artists, and metalwork seemed to come to us in a peculiarly kind of uh, intuitive uh, and um, rapid way um, because of our, our background in drawing, which I wasn't expecting at all. Uh, if I, and I'm sure if I had been trained in metalwork correctly, um, none of this kind of work would, have, would, would, have, would be what it is. 
Another key moment in, those, in that period of time of our careers was understanding the role of the physical in relation to the drawn. So this is a drawing that we were handed by Neil Spiller. I think he's spoken here as well, maybe. Um, it almost caught fire straight away because he put it down on a very hot bench that we'd just been working on. And it was a sketch for a table. And, and it's an A4 sheet of tracing paper. And, and he said, you know, tell me when it's made. And we made it without any further conversation. Um, and then Neil went off and did a whole bunch of other drawings. And, I, and that was something, it was an experience we hadn't had as students, this idea that you, it, you, you draw something, you make it, it's done. You draw something, you make it, further drawings come from what's made, and this continuous loop starts, starts to um, emerge. Certainly the next major step in, 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 in how we've started to move our work on was access to resources. So um, around 2000 or so, we managed to get access to this workshop in East Germany through friendship in, 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 at the Bartlett. It started to, to have the potential to make things on a larger scale. I have to give credit to Nick, uh, my partner in, in the studio at the time, who now runs a steel fabrication firm in Germany, who made the next project I'm going to talk about in a moment. He published this book in 2000, and if, you, if you've not come across this, I really recommend you all read it. It was one of the very, very early uh, texts on, on computer-aided manufacturing and architecture, certainly in the UK, where we were trying to get our heads around what these sorts of processes uh, might mean to practice. The, only the medical physics department in the university had um, FDM machines in those days. So we started to make these pieces, and, and, and this moment where your drawing appears in the monitor of a fabrication uh, uh, machine is quite an extraordinary kind of moment. It's completely common now, but for people of my age, that was magic, you know, to see a drawing pop up on a screen and then see that drawing emerge like a dance on a sheet of steel to watch the plasma cutter move around almost at the same pace as a rotating pen. Uh, that was kind of really quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, 3D printing, as I said, in the medical physics department, our approach to that was new technology comes along, make something you couldn't possibly have made without it. Yeah? Don't make something you could have made a different way. Uh, and this piece, um, which we made you know, now 19 years ago, 3D printed, um, a crucible for a series of, of sensory devices. Long story, that project. And then this piece here was the result of an invitation to take part in a touring exhibition in the UK called Making Buildings. Uh, we were the only exhibitors who had no built work at all uh, to be invited into the show. Every other exhibitor in the show had quite well-known practitioners. We had nothing. And we made this piece for the show. Uh, it was a series of unique uh, uh, pieces of steel folded and cut that went together in different configurations. This is the configuration above of its first outing in Walsall Art Gallery, the Caruso St. John building in the Midlands. And then the bottom one is a drawing of its final outing uh, back in the Bartlett six or seven journeys later. And what this project was starting to say is that the physical can start to be a, a place of, um, of, of locating um, its audience in space. And there's another array of, of, of um, sensory uh, technologies that start to measure proximity and, um, uh, and intimacy. So this piece was called the blusher because if you got too close to it, it started to glow red. Now, I've just stuck this in here for a moment because I, I've actually made the one thing I'm working on right now is just a very, very small project, which is an in, 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 in insertion into a house in London. Uh, which is not, not a single wall is straight. Uh, it's a tapered house. Uh, um, the floors are all on level. The staircase is moving around. And I decided rather than rip everything out and rebuild it, I actually wanted to put in this kind of prosthetic uh, new, new insertion of the stairs, which starts, for me, summing up some of the ideas that we've been, uh, been describing here through drawing and making and using a technology for somehow it's, it's the purpose is for, for not for which it was made. So um, going into things in a bit more detail, uh, this project here is called 5502. And uh, I only want to focus on, on, on some, some of the aspects of it in, in this talk. But one of the main ones being with the process by, by which it was designed. 
So the site for it is in Kielder, which is um, Northumberland. It's uh, north of England on the borders of Scotland. Hadrian's Wall is only 20 minutes away. It's a very, very ancient landscape. It was a hunting ground for the kings of England, you know, hundreds of years ago. This reservoir was built by the uh, Labour government of the 1970s, led by Harold Wilson. And by the time the reservoir was finished, when Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister, there was no industry for the water to serve. So it was a white elephant um, the day it was finished. So it now is the site for quite a lot of um, pieces. And we were invited to um, design and build a shelter on any site we liked. Picking a site is not something we get uh, a chance to do very often. And of course, it's a yet another design decision. That's one image of this site, and this is another. It gets drained quite regularly. It's a working reservoir. It's also a working forest, where the, the landscape that had previously had villages and roads and all sorts of stuff going on with it has now been eradicated and transformed into this place of production, but also of leisure. These were themes we were absolutely determined to bring out in the nature of the work. One of the things we felt critical about of other projects being built in Keeler was they were adding, in a sense, stories of other places to the landscape. And, the, and of course, there's, there's a legitimate place for that in the world. But for us, the story of Keeler itself wasn't being spoken about. So this is a forest which gets scanned now. Where every single tree is tagged and known, and the, the landscape is manicured on a tree-by-tree -tree basis. So this was time to get back in touch with Nick, who had left the Bartlett in 20, uh, 2006, the same year as Peter, as, as it happened. We hadn't worked together for about four or five years. And he was making these formworks now for um, wind turbines in Germany. He, he knocks one of these out every week uh, in, in this space, which is about 120 meters long and, and 38 meters wide. Um, the very, very first thing was that we built was this. We didn't do any drawings. Um, all we wanted to know was what sort of stability we could get from two sheets of steel, folded, wrapped around, facing each other, and with just two wells. We knew the budget was going to be absolutely tiny for this project, and rather than approach it in any other normal sequence, we made this piece first. And, uh, and made it in about three or four hours, uh, and then we managed to talk about qualities that are extremely difficult to portray accurately in drawing. These sorts of drawings were then developed through as a series of tactics to talk about space and movement on the site. Uh, and the piece on the top right-hand side was an exam that Nick set for all his workforce. He has about 40 staff. We wanted the same welders to work on the project throughout, even though we were using semi-automatic welding processes. So further drawings, further forms of um, representation were developed. On the bottom right-hand side is a sketch model being made in the, in the, in the workshop in London, but unusually for, for um, to, to, compared to most conventional processes of, of design, the, the, this model was being informed by the one-to-one -one physical artifact that had already been made. So, you know, representation, we were scaling down from one-to-one -one instead of scaling up. Uh, we had to go for planning, which was not discussed at all uh, when the project was first commissioned. So we were too busy to, to spend too much time on this, and we, can, we asked a colleague to represent the project for us in a simple, graphic way for the local community to, to make their judgment on, and uh, they failed it. And they said they didn't like it, they thought it looked like a car crashing into the landscape, and uh, it was a, this is very much Brexit country, you have to let you know. <laughs> any, form of, um, any form of alien architecture um, was definitely not what they wanted to see. So we took a different tactic and developed these kind of series of camouflage drawings, um, the drawings that immerse the project in the forest in, in, in ways that would more truly reflect its experience. Meanwhile, in the spirit of our practice, 16 makers, and all those projects we've been kind of developing over the years, we go back to the factory and start to just ask questions of day-to-day -day processes like folding and rolling. What are the limits of those processes? Can you take the guard off? If you're the owner of the factory, <laughs> of course you can. So uh, Nick took the guard off the press in order to get different folds. One of the most enjoyable conversations I've had about this project was with Robert Aish. I don't know if many of you know Robert Aish. He's a, a developer, a software developer for the last 35 years, big developer in Bentley, then Autodesk, and so on. 
uh, one of the founders of the Smart Geometry Unit and Smart Modeling Unit in Fosters. When he saw um, our, this project, he said, um, some of those geometries um, can't be made physically without, without you um, breaking some of the rules. And this is an in intriguing um, subject for me, where to truly engage with the processes of manufacturing, our own design tools um, are too limited. So some of these processes, like here on the left, are quite medieval, bending 40 by 40 solid steel bar as a handrail, and developing this project at one-to-one -one without any complete set of drawings. The drawing on the right was developed after the building of the piece on the left. Um, having things like gantry crane. This is not a model for practice, I'm sure, as you can tell by now. Um, this is only a model for experimental research projects when your friend owns a steel factory and uh, you, you've, you've been given a small amount of money to build something. Um, we're not in any way rec saying this is, this is um, the way everything should operate every day. Uh, the two welders who had won the competition in the factory came to build a project in England. It's their first time ever in their lives out of Germany. Uh, one thing that I like about the, the image on, on, on the right is the jigs that are on the ground in the forest are the same jigs that set the project up in the factory. The same two people, the same tools, the same setting out mechanisms. The whole piece went up in about four days, eight tonnes of steel. One thing that uh, in, in an environment like this we hadn't anticipated is that we got a phone call one day from our client or our client's representative saying, we've got good news for you, everyone. Um, your foundations are in. And we said, well, hang on, hang on. We haven't actually told you where we want the foundations yet. And they said, no, it's too late for that. They're in. Um, we had a load of spare concrete. And they just that's the nature of this sort of part of the world. They're building roads. Concrete's about to go off. They sent it to our site, and they cast this slab which we wanted it to be much smaller, but also the cast it too fast, it was on a camber. There was quite a lot of adjusting had to be done on site later. So that, that's how that piece ended up. It's called 5502 because of its coordinates. It wasn't until taking these sorts of images through analog cameras that one started to think about you know, the relationship of the digitally designed object and the analog photographed object. And it was only around that time that we got our hands on, on uh, laser scanning um, and again, I was talking to Liam about this earlier on. We went up a year later when Matt uh, Shaw and Will Trossel were still students at the Bartlett before they, they established ScanLab, and they scanned it for us. And of course, apart from this technology, as I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with now, apart from it producing kind of visualizations that are exciting and new and fluid and kind of impossible in, in many, many ways, um, they do start to raise all sorts of interesting questions about the underlying message of, of what I'm saying is that there's a difference between the drawn and the made. Uh, and it's a difference that we, that we have spent our careers embracing and experimenting with, that zero tolerance, that, that need for tolerance. So um, this scan you know, went on to produce a series of studies which um, for us are not about measuring kind of fault, uh, but they are about, you know, re re reinforcing the point that what gets built is different to what gets designed. So what you're seeing in deep red is where a model aligns, with the, where the, the, the point cloud model aligns with the CAD model, and where it's ghosted, it's when they don't align. Now, there's no surprise, but one of the things about that kind of, um, in, shall we say, in development uh, in, in, in our array of design tools is that, of course, somebody will regard that as a fault whereas we regard that as a, as, as a positive uh, difference. So, of course, you, you know what ScanLab are doing now. They're doing stuff like scanning cities, pyramids, and, and you name it for the BBC. I'm, I'm going to quickly run through an unbuilt project to make a series of different points um, using the same technology. This is a, a brief we got from a Central School of Speech and Drama in London to build a pavilion for experimental theater. Because this is the kind of space they were using normally, a leftover plot in the school. Um, that isn't rubbish, that is actually um, a set for, for a performance. Um, it's located in North London um, in this very unusual kind of arrangement of on the right, a, an institutional school of drama and on the left, across the street, a commercial 
theatre, but that is known for putting on first performances of new productions. So on one side you have this theatre of learning, and the other one is a place of first outings. Uh, there's an interesting creative tension between the two schools which we sought to exploit on that plot. Uh, students put on some really interesting um, models and took on board notions of how this space could be developed. And I got a small amount of funding to keep one of my students for a few months to, to kind of distill those ideas into one fully described piece. And it turned out it happened to be Matt Shaw from ScanLab before he went into that world. So we took the idea of a standard truss for a truck, the biggest one you could get, uh, and how big could that get? How, how could you um, um, manipulate and remodel um, and use the braking system of a truck to create platforms and so on? Again, thinking about um, our, 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 our interest in making things like we made in, in the 5502 shelter. Uh, we went on and, and laid out the project at one-to-one -one in a local tennis court. So this is using ropes from the theatre, laid them on the ground to get a sense of scale. These are the students sitting up on the wall here to walk around the plan, sort of exploring the plan at one-to-one, -one, scanning it, and bringing it back out and comparing it to the design model. That project evolved um, slowly and unfortunately never got never got to the point where it looked likely it was going to be built. This is as far as it got. This, this representation, which happens to locate us in front of the Slade School of Art in London, you know, demonstrates the concepts behind it. So that's um, a bit irritating, um, you know, to kind of invest your time in something and it not getting built when its actual essence is, 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 is very much with those intentions in mind. So I um, thought we'd take a different tack and um, I've always wanted to work with these people. Um, they're called Shunt. They're a theater company. They're a bit, I don't know if you've heard of Punch Drunk. Um, it's another company in London, but Shunt and Punch Drunk, are these two companies in London that do immersive theater, do these extraordinary uh, performances where you're almost, it's almost guerrilla theater. It, it, theater that takes you by surprise and subverts your expectations of who's a player, where is the scene, how long is the act, and so forth. Um, and I was just attracted to work with them because I liked their work, and gave them a ring, and they said they'd be, they weren't really, really busy at the moment, and they were very happy to work with us. One of the projects we, 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 we presented them was this piece by one of our students, Katrina, uh, and it was her sketch for what we should do for the theater, which is to build this kind of prosthetic shell on the outside of the building and create these other kind of architectural kind of prosthetics to look into the existing building. And that was all we had. And they said, fine, let's, let's go with that. So we started scanning the school. And we said um, to Shunt what the day was going to be when we started scanning. And they said they'd just turn up. Uh, but what they didn't tell us what they were going to do. They gave us a few hints. They didn't say very much. But in the course of, of, of um, setting up the scan, three spaces became very, very in, in, interesting to us. And it's very interesting to scope out a site with uh, performers and, and, and theater writers uh, and thinkers. Uh, scoping out a site in a forest with you know, your, your mates who are architects is one thing. But scoping out a site with theater people is very different. And they're looking for, for very, very different qualities. Obviously, notions of reveal and, uh, and, and layering are, are, are key. So this was one space at the top of the building they were intrigued by. This was another, a staircase that cut vertically through the building was another. And then this elevation was the, was the third space that they, they were fascinated by. And so were, so were we. It cut below the ground. It, it kind of revealed this, um, this entire mask of the building. So as we were scanning it dead straight, as you, as you might do, um, they were carrying out a series of performances. This was one where um, Hannah was sitting in a chair, reciting some text and crying. This was another one where the figures on the ground uh, kind of laid out a fake murder scene. And then this one was a, as a, um, a rotunda performance where we were all asked to stand on the roof and walk in a very, very slow circle around Louise, who sat in the middle, and she also performed um, a piece. 
So it was kind of in a, um, a, series, an ep a series of episodes of scanning and performance where the two kind of players or practitioners are, are not in full knowledge of what each other's um, up to. It's only on examining the point, of course, you don't see the point cloud models when you're doing all that. You're just thinking what they might be like. But when you start to look at them and you see these sorts of um, strange mirroring effects, this is Hannah on the right in that room sitting in front of a mirror, and then there's her doppelganger the other side of the mirror. That's, that's started to trigger some really interesting conversations between us about actually making an architectural kind of intervention into the building, which is the other side of the mirror, which was not in, 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 in the space that's known. So we went back to the workshop and stuck a bunch of mirrors on robotic arms and scanned them as they moved through space and started to capture this sort of sense of, of, of halo or this other point cloud kind of um, otherness that's, that, that's going on in, 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 uh, in, in the process. And then went back to those rooms and set up a series of interventions of, of reflective surfaces and, uh, and um, positions for theater, guessing with them what, what that kind of process might be, and started to, to plan out a second event two or three months later. Each of these rooms then were very precisely, um, surgically almost, kind of, you know, examined for these very precise set of moves that would project a series of, of performances into this other space. And then we invited 60 people to come along on a particular night. And after all of these um, interventions were in place, invite them to, to um, follow a kind of a, almost a repeat, partial repeat of the event itself, whilst even more performers turned up uh, and disrupted the process. All 60 people were divided into four groups. They went into very, very different um, parts of the site and came back to, to one screen at the end of the evening where they watched a, a review of the live scan, a, a review of the original scan, CCTV footage, photography, uh, live video, and so forth. And what, what that project seemed to be saying, whereas 5502 is, you know, it's, it's solid, it's the physical, it reminds you while you're an architect. This is dealing with, you know, some of the same technologies, but being in free fall, out, out, totally out of your comfort zone, where the assemblage of a series of events in space are brought together in, in the model. And it, it, it just, it, it, it came out of um, conversation, it came out of critiquing the, um, the site, the process, and, and the, potential, the potential for working together in, in collaborative processes. So that was the project I was working on um, when I was invited to become head of the Bartles. <laughs> so uh, I haven't done any more on that since. I was actually in SciArc, strangely enough, um, when I got a phone call from UCL um, well, I was in LA, I should say. Um, and um, that project has got a lot, of, a lot of questions left to answer in terms of where it might go, might go next, in terms of um, no notions of how one might construct spaces knowingly that they are um, kind of a, a real collage, you know, a 3D collage. So that goes on. Um, and that, that's all I want to say really about my own work. I'm going to very, very quickly now finish off on things that are happening in the school, just to wrap, wrap things up as quickly as I can. We, um, you might have saw, we, we celebrated our 175th recently. And this phrase was found in Donaldson's inaugural lecture. He was the first Bartlett professor. Frederick is the current Bartlett professor and Peter was the one before him. So that, that idea, wandering in a labyrinth of experiments, thought was incredibly powerful. It's a kind of, it's such a contemporary phrase. And one thing that had never been done, certainly to my knowledge, was a review of the school and what its traditions actually are. It's great to be mentioned in the same sentence as SciArc. It's a huge honor. It's, it's the school we always want to be kind of connected to, and others like the AA and so forth. But, Lots of people can tell, if you do your research, it's not a school known for very well-known singular architectural figures, like the AA, you've got Zaha, you, you, you've got um, Rogers, you've got a whole bunch of people, 
individuals that have come out of that school. The Bartlett, if you look back on its history of 175 years, it's known for reinventing practice. That's what it seems to kind of have in its DNA. It also seems to have no, you know, this absolute um, conviction to test the, the, the status of the drawing. Uh, those previous drawings are done in the early 1990s. This is what students are, are doing today. Doug Miller and So Young Zhu. Uh, Margaret Bursa's uh, work in Unit 11 with Mark uh, Smart and Laura Allen. Um, Emil Tigrell from Unit 24, Penelope Harlambidu. Um, Guan Li and RC6. I know there's an uh, RC1 are here, is that right? <laughs> from the Bartlett. Um, Frederic joined us uh, in 2010 or 2011 and focused on that part of the school which started to examine questions of computation and production and design in collaboration with uh, Alicia Andrasek, now Gilles Retzin, Manuel Garcia, Vincent Soler. Um, CJ Lim's unit are looking at now, if you're following it, um, notions of dystopia and utopia, big questions and, and looking at narrative and big drawings that are starting to challenge um, audiences' perceptions of cities and their own um, scripts. Um, Tom Sivens, um, one of my former students, looking at robotics and scenography. Uh, Ollie Palmer, um, Ant Ballet, and, and uh, Maria Knudsen Hall on architecture and nature. And, and it goes on. These sorts of practices are central to, to the school's, school's DNA. And, what, what I, and this is Sonia um, uh, Magdiras, Project Carving a Giant. I think, uh, if you haven't looked at it online, I'd, I'd encourage you all to take a look. Uh, this image doesn't do it justice. It's, it's a three-minute film. Um, exploring the, um, the Kalava um, uh, mythology of, of, of um, Scandinavia and over the question, how do we preserve our knowledge for millennia? So as I said, um, alumni, the school's known for certain types of um, graduate, you know, like, you know, AHMM, um, Simon, Jonathan, Paul and Peter. It's also known for people like Beatrice, uh, Far Farshid, Teresa and Jane or Ken Adams down here, who's designed all the James Bond sets and Dr. Strangelove sets, or Justine and Brett, who were students around the time. Uh, I, was a, I was a student. Um, Usman Hack, who's developed notions of performance in the city, emerging out of the work of Stephen Gage, who was taught by Gordon Pask, so it goes back to the 1950s, uh, Yaisa Reichardt. Um, Stu Fish, now led by two Bartlett graduates, Soundform, uh, Paul Bavister, Asif Khan, uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with his work, and Marianne Coletti's work, the dialogue we're having with Marianne in Innsbruck. Um, work from uh, Duggan Morris, which comes out of the, say, the traditions of Neil McLaughlin, uh, Pablo Gill, uh, uh, PhD students of, of, of Peter Cook. Um, Charles Holland designed, designed this house, as I'm sure you all, all know, for Grayson Perry. Um, FAT are a Bartlett practice, although um, didn't get celebrated that much and, uh, until recently, and AHMM. So I want to just finish on um, a bit more about buildings and, and their influence on, on, on schools and ways of thinking. While 22 Gordon Street was being rebuilt, we, uh, some of you might know, we went to this temporary building up, up the road from the school, Hampstead Road. It's a former furniture factory uh, belonging to British Home Stores. Um, there's a thing called HS2, High Speed 2 railway line coming into London that um, put a compulsory purchase order on the building. So all the development in the school in the last four to five years uh, have been a series of fortunate kind of um, events. Number one, having the potential to grow, of course. But number two, having things like local buildings losing their value by by 200% overnight, and we were able to move into them for short, for short lets. But one of the things that was really critical for, for, for me in this building is that I felt, and it's often heard it said before, architecture schools run in sort of 25 year cycles, and it had been almost 25 years since uh, Peter and Christine you know, reinvented the school, and it was time to reinvent it again. And that building allowed us to think very differently, totally different set of spaces, totally different sets of conditions. 
It allowed us to go and look at a building in this environment, which is the Olympic Park, and it's where we've just built uh, this, this set of um, resources, um, which has just, just opened last year. So we've got 6,000 6, square meters of space, which we're sharing with computer science, environmental design, civil engineering, um, bio-integrated design, performance and interaction, situated practice, and so on. It's, it's quite a risky project, of course. It's asking a school to recognize another center of gravity. It's asking a school to, to think about where its home is. You know, um, having a second building is a bit like having, say, a second home. It's, it's not somewhere where you, you associate with um, as the center. But the thing about this space, like your space here, it offers volume that you can't get in central London. And, and one of the things I'm hoping that will come out of that and our, our potential um, futures together is, is, is the way in which these new forms of, of, of practice, these new forms of engagement with, 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 with disciplines such as computer science, uh, environmental design and so forth, that um, a different sort of generation will, will, will begin. So um, I'll finish there and, and, and just finish on one little idea that Hernan and myself discussed. Uh, this morning, and that is um, Lola Land, <laughs> uh, to, to just complete the conversation. Um, there is this fantastic opportunity for these two schools to spar with one another, and we really want to start this relationship with London and LA on, on, a, on a, a faster tempo. So it's been a real uh, pleasure to, to be invited here to speak to you. And I'm hoping if it, it's followed up with a series of exhibitions, a series of um, exchanges between units and students and staff in the years to come. Thank you very much.